Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live. Tonight, we are joined by writers, directors, Vincent and James Coleman from their mm -hmm. new movie, The Burned Over District. Guys, welcome to the show. Uh, congratulations on the film. I hope you're all doing well. I'm excited to talk about the film. Obviously, you guys are brothers. I have to ask, who's the older of the two? I'm the older brother. James is a year difference. Oh. Yeah, I'm a year younger. He's a year older than me. Oh, that's cool. You guys are very close in age. So I got to ask you, growing up, being so close in age, how did your passion for filmmaking begin? Um, I mean, at, at 12 years old, we were, we decided to make a movie with our friend's uh, grandpa's VHS camera. Let's get right to it. James, the movie, The Burned Over District, is based on events that happened in Western New York in the 1800s. What can you tell us about the real events that inspired your film? Burnover District came about because of him watching a documentary and I was basically writing a script about a cult, but the, the direction of the cult really wasn't clear and it didn't necessarily have a, a real pathway that it was going down. So what the Burnover District is, is the surrounding areas of upstate New York where right around the time of the advent of the Erie Canal, which is the late 1800s, there was an uprising of religious movements. Mm -hmm. And again, it was the Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, um, the Fox Sisters, and, and several more. And our idea was, what if one of these religions stuck around throughout the centuries, kind of undetected? And if you've ever been to upstate New York, there's a lot of towns and a lot of exits you can get off when you're on the throughway and the highway where you enter a town that kind of seems forgotten, almost like a memory. Yeah. And you start to ask, how do people make any money here? What do people do here? And there's usually a church and a couple of houses scattered around. And there's always a gas station that feels, uh, oh, if you walk into it, it's like, you, you always tell yourself, I'm probably going to get killed if I go in here. <laughs> so we wanted to incorporate that really uncomfortable feel of a small town where I guess it's just kind of forgotten by time. Exactly, exactly. Uh, now, Vincent, the film revolves around brother and sister, uh, Will and Katie Pleasant. Now, the film starts off straight off with a tragedy involving Will, and then we start to see his arc develop and build. Uh, how did you guys approach developing Will's character? That was for Vincent. Is it how do we develop? How do we approach developing our own character? I'm sorry, we're gonna have to repeat the question. Uh, yeah, can you give us one sec to kind of figure out this technical thing? This is a little bit of a a pain here because of the live feed. Well, let me see if I can. Let's do this. Hold on. Let me. Maybe I can help on my end here. Uh, let me see. Does that make it better for you guys? Is that a little better? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh Vincent, when it came when it came time to create Will's character, how did you guys approach it? What were some of your influences behind his character? Well, we put a lot of ourselves into the characters, honestly. A, a lot of uh, a lot of things, I think a lot of writers do that where they not necessarily insert themselves into the story. That's that's a big mistake, but uh, a lot of the a lot of things we went through in our lives, we try to kind of pull from that. And uh, we, we see that the sister has a lot of uh, turmoil and animosity with her mother, and she doesn't necessarily seem like she cares too much about what's going on with her brother. And not to say that's our mother, but we know people better like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, we like that dynamic where you, you feel like you can never really make someone happy. And that was actually the, the thought behind Katie's character is that Katie, no matter what she could do, was never good enough for anybody, even though, even though she was so kind and giving and trying to be there for her brother. And even trying to navigate, you know, doing that with her mother around who just seems to be miserable and can never please her. And we wanted to have that, although it's not said, there's an implication that the parents are divorced and they never got along anyways. And it kind yeah. of falls onto the children. And that that's why our main character, Will, has moved away. He doesn't want to be around them. You don't really see him interact much with his mother at all because, yeah, I, I guess it's well, just really you know, what he wants to do. It's just something he's trying to get away from. And my impression of the mother is she's she's a very mean woman. I mean, not uh, the warmest of mothers out there. She's kind of cold-hearted uh, in how she regards other people. And I think that plays big in how Will's character and Katie's develop. Because it gives us, it gives, it gave me a background into how these two people became the way they were. 
Now, Vincent, this film has quite a few different elements, uh, Native American lore, paranormal phenomenon. Uh, how did you guys try to balance all these different elements into the film? To actually answer your first question, uh, Katie and Will's relationship is so close because when you grow up in a situation like that where your parents aren't necessarily emotionally there for you and kind of nasty and you're always kind of looking for that validation that you end up getting very close with your siblings. And that's really what we wanted the film to be about is the, the relationship between the brother and sister. But uh, to go off what you're saying with the, the elements, uh, th that's one thing we talked about is we originally approached it with we want to do one of those films that's kind of a slow burn, kind of like a contemporary ghost story in the beginning, a horror story where, you know, you're discovering some weird things. And is it what we think it is? Is it ghost? Is it demonic? Is exactly. it just crazy people? But the thought always was we wanted to turn up, we wanted to turn up the craziness to a hundred. And there, there was going to be that shift no matter what in the middle of the film where it goes from the lighting is very calm and normal and, and, and just a regular life type thing. And then as things get crazy, you know, you get into that neon kind of insanity where the lighting is crazy and then all the things you're seeing are crazy and it's like almost like you're have it's basically a dream turned into a nightmare like I, a cosmic yeah, dream yeah. like we we took a lot of inspiration from like mandy mm -hmm. uh, color out of space yeah. but the original opening like the first i'd say 30 to 40 minutes are very much like an 824 film where it's very you know things are happening but it's at a very slow pace where you're really getting to know the characters and seeing these things happen to them before things turn up to 100 yeah yeah now in the film very prominent on will's property is this big hole in the ground okay now that can be seen representing the paranormal aspect uh the lore behind it is native american for you guys writing that into the script what is that big hole in the back of will's property what does that mean and how does it ultimately affect the outcome of how this story where this story is being taken so ultimately the whole is supposed to represent, it, it's supposed to represent, um, I don't know how to explain this <laughs> the best way, but the whole is basically a man-made creation of evil. And what that is, is when, um, when the character says to him, it'll make you see things that aren't real and that they used to discard the evil that mm -hmm. lived amongst them. What we kind of interpreted as the burned over district when hearing the actual history of it is all these religious movements popping up back back you know back into creation even of christianity judaism there was always these prophets that claimed they were hearing the voice of god or being sent messages from god so our thought was whatever this whole is whether they really are hearing it or not that something is telling them to do something and that's kind of what we thought is happening around the area of upstate new york so what was coming from this pit was voices and uh demands and and people telling them that we want rituals we want baptisms and other places maybe the natives before them they knew what it was more so than yeah. the settlers did so when they what they heard was this is where to put the evil send them cast them down cast them into this hell so all of these evil dead people that had been thrown down there created an, an evil that that, that fed into this cosmic force. And, uh, and there was a lot of Mayan influences in that as well, like the rituals that you see. And there's a particular scene where a ceremony is being held by the cult. Let's call them a cult for now. And we see the men, uh, sorry, the women faint to the ground, but the men are kept standing. Uh, what is this, uh, the significance of that? Why do the women fall? And the men remain. The men remain standing. Don't really answer, really do. Um, to be honest, that was kind of a. There's an answer to that. Do you know what? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You can. You wrote that part. <laughs> uh so so really, what it is, is is these these messages, these voices, this this calling that they're getting. It's it's very orgasmic for the women because women are the ones who bear the children, and that that's what the the call is continuing to try to to keep keep their beliefs alive and and obviously as time goes on that dwindles and people aren't necessarily into it so when you have these kids you can indoctrinate at such a young age and, and these women now are actually hearing that as you see later on fred's daughter says i'm sorry you're as blind as the rest of them because it is a calling that only they're able to see at these exact moments throughout these rituals that mm -hmm. 
most people can't. So when, when Katie and Will are actually being called to it, it's special. They're, they're basically what these prophets are. They're the ones that don't need the ritual. They don't need to be brought in. They're actually already hearing it. They're already open to it spiritually to be a part of whatever this is. Okay. Now, uh, Vincent, this cult has existed for hundreds of years. Uh, it, are we supposed to take, like, the, the leader of this cult, is he a madman, or does he have a real connection to the other side, some kind of cosmic connection? Or is he just like real-life cult leaders that we see today that are power-hungry and they're just crazy? Um, we wanted the audience to feel like he was crazy in the beginning, but then we decided early in the movie to see that he actually wasn't when you saw that beam scene with the hole because we wanted we wanted you to feel the the um the lead character's reaction to seeing something you know that they couldn't explain so they in the back of their heads it's like they know something's going on but they still are trying to save each other and figure it out if that makes sense yeah yeah uh james there's a another scene when will is captured and he's being uh, drugged towards that pit, he's sort of splayed out in this biblical crucifixion style. I'm assuming that was done deliberately. Am I correct? Yeah, actually, the whole character breakdown, we kind of wanted to have a Christ figure and then kind of an antichrist. So Daniel Danson and Will, and you have Daniel Danson with the darker facial hair, the longer hair, but they look similar but contrasting. And yes, I mean, there's... A lot of uh, Christ-like references, when you pay attention to it, uh, he's splayed out the white shirt, the hair's down, the beard. Um, he's stabbed in the abdomen, yeah. tossed into the hole, and then there's a rebirth where he comes back. And it's like, you know, that, you know, how Christ returned eventually. Yeah, yeah I, to I totally get it. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a moment where... Uh, where the mother goes into a room and she is followed by a hooded figure very quickly. It sort of it reminded me of The Exorcist 3 in that very, very scary moment. Uh, who came up out of you two with that idea to sort of pay tribute to The Exorcist 3? I'll have to take credit on that one, even though we really do think of all the ideas together. That was... Uh... A really cool scene to me because you weren't expecting that long take that went on forever to someone to come out with uh i forgot was it like was it like hedge clippers hedge or something yeah. or shears yeah. or whatever you call them but that was that that scene always stuck with me since i was like seven years old it has stuck with a lot, with a lot of people movie, so. yeah yeah that was definitely a, a moment yeah because I, I remember there are certain moments you remember in horror films and that's one of those that always hey you remember that awesome scene in exodus 3 and i was like why not do something similar to that because at this point, we didn't show any cult, and I think a, a lot of what we want to do is a misdirection where we didn't want people to know really what this movie was. So when you see that quick moment of this big guy come on and grab her, you're really asking what the hell is happening now? Like, because yeah. there's really no indication of this yet. Yeah, uh, and I'm with you. on In The Exorcist 3, that scene is still talked about today in being scary and just coming out of nowhere. Uh do you guys, would you guys describe this group, are they a cult per today's standards, or are they a legitimate religious group? How do you guys view them? I would say to themselves, they are a legitimate religious movement, but to the outsider, they come out as some crazy cult. Like Fred says to them, it's this dance and family, and they've ruined the town with their insanity. They've been a part, a staple in this town since the beginning of their conception basically since the late 1800s they've been around worshiping so it's it's very well known in the town but as an outsider like katie and will to them it's like who are these crazy people and what are they doing and we tried to show that the town a lot of the town is mixed in with them a lot of the politicians uh the, the police force mm -hmm. are all a part of this and they might not be living in the in the in the mansion or be part of the main call but they're believing the things that they're told mm -hmm. and a lot of them probably haven't seen what the main cult has seen they haven't seen the portals open up they haven't gotten the messages so for them it's just blind worship we kind of wanted them to seem like they were a family that's been in this old town for a long time and they have no reason really to spread their religion so that's why you did not hear of them like yeah 
like you know, like the other religions that spread their word. They only, you know, you only hear of them when you're about to be sacrificed. Now, uh, before we go, I have one final question. Katie is referred to by them as the chosen one. Uh, the way the the movie plays out, it's sort of left up to the viewer to sort of kind of figure out why they think she is the chosen one. I want to hear your guys' opinion. You wrote the characters. Why do they think Katie is the chosen one? So to play off more of, is Daniel crazy? So they believe very much in destiny. As he says to Will, I've seen you before, and this has always been your fate. So when Katie stumbles upon them at the gas station and he meets her, he sees a new woman in town. He sees a new, a new person that he believes his gods have brought to him. And then when they're performing that ritual, something called to her and brought them out to her. Mm -hmm. For him to see that, they think, okay, they chose you. And in this void of existence, they gave you this gift, this gift of sight. You can see it. You can hear it. You saw what happened. And in his arrogance, when they go to, to capture her, to bring her in, they uh, they take her brother and they and he says to him, what are the voices? What's down there? And in his arrogance, he doesn't realize that Will is the one that heard this, too. So they are actually the chosen ones together. It's supposed to be them, two who rule together. Yeah. And in his arrogance, he casts him. He stabs him, casts him into this this hole. And the, the beings that he says, they, they look at us as playthings. They they spit him back out without his knowledge that they're, it's now a part of him. So when he comes back out, the whole the whole destiny, his fate was to eradicate the cult and become their leader, mm -hmm. ultimately. And then he offers. So when he keeps saying you're you're no longer tethered to your your earthly attachments, so him still being alive keeps Katie from being able to fully rule until he becomes that being at the end when, yeah, basically uh, Daniel Danson like he pissed off the gods and you know, decided to be, he wanted to be the one man with all these women surrounding him, but that's not what they wanted. And he got what he deserved. Exactly. Yeah, so instead of the cult worshiping, they're, 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 I don't want to say it's a God. It's, it's a cosmic force. Yeah. It's like a deity. Instead of it worshiping yeah. them, he, they want, he wanted them to worship him. Mm -hmm. So when, when God was presented to him, he, he broke to his knees screaming, God, please, like from life to death, screaming to God. And then his God is actually comforting him, but if you pay attention, Will spits up blood right before he gouges eyes. It's it's Will, oh, what's left of Will doing that? Yeah. What's left of his soul is still allowing him to yeah, have yeah. some control. We wanted to make it seem like Will had a choice there. He could have, you know, had Daniel Danson still in that group, but he decided he was through with him after all that he put him through. So Exactly, and it's the ultimate story. The, the fall of man is pride. Guys, I want to thank you so much again. Uh, the movie is called uh, The Burned Over District. Uh, we don't have a premiere date yet for the public, but it should be coming out soon. Written and directed by our guests, Vincent and James Coleman. Uh, when it does come out, check it out. This film is very interesting. It's bloody. We didn't get to talk about the, the amount of gore and blood, but it's, it's, a, it's a great story. Uh, lots of action, lots of blood. So congratulations to both of you guys. On the film, I want to thank our audience, those of you who are tuning in live, and those of you who will be watching later on. On behalf of our guests, Vincent and James Coleman and myself, stay safe, stay walking. Good night, everybody. All right, thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. It's been great.